Okay, so uh, getting started, um, we're very happy to, to welcome you here today um, to our Introduction to Oral History workshop um, with the Queer Newark Oral History Project. Um, and a big thanks to the New Jersey Council for the Humanities for their generous support for our session. Um, my name is Erica Fuger, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm very happy to, to be here and sharing some knowledge with you today about the process of conducting oral history interviews and just some context about everything that you need to do uh, from start to finish. When you're first thinking about conceptualizing your, your project to how you want to conduct your interviews to what to do with those interviews afterwards. Um, so you may be wondering what exactly is oral history? Um, you can think about it as a research method, um, a way of conducting interviews, um, you know, very, it's very specific to kind of bringing in these multimedia um, and multidisciplinary approaches um, to conducting interviews. So you can think about oral history as long form interviews themselves tend to take about one and a half to two hours. And it's a specific interview technique uh, where the kind of questions you ask are, are open ended and really allow the person um, who is sharing their story to kind of share it through their own kind of way of, of engaging with I guess, storytelling and with uh, you know, their own personal experiences. It's a firsthand eyewitness account. So you're asking questions about historical events or about community experiences. And it's also a biographical process. So you're thinking about someone's life um, from start to present essentially. So really thinking about kind of the backstory, their childhood, uh, where they came from, the kind of experiences they've had throughout their lifetime. And you're also helping generate a, what's called a primary source. Um, so really thinking about oral history as a way to kind of create new materials um, that maybe challenge the ways that history is told and bring new people's voices into the fold in understanding the past. It's also very descriptive. Um, you're asking questions in a way uh, that allows for there to be stories to be told so that you can kind of feel like you're in that event with the person who's sharing them. And it's also a process of um, sharing memory and making meaning of the past. Um, so it allows the person who's being interviewed to really think about um, kind of the lasting impact of particular events on their life. And I'll also mention that um, we like to bring accessibility and inclusivity to our approach to oral history. Um, so really working with each uh, person you're interviewing to make sure that the way that the interview is set up, um, you know, meets their needs and that you're also um, bringing diverse voices into the ways that you are recording uh, these important stories. So it's really a democratized version of history um, and making sure that you know, all of those voices get included in the historical record. So I'm just gonna play a, a brief kind of clip from the uh, center, the Oral History Center, which talks a little bit more kind of about the, the background about this practice. So what is oral history? Oral history means many different things to many different people. But academics have defined oral history since the late 1940s as a research method that asks eyewitnesses to talk about their lives and their own experiences in usually very extensive uh, life history interviews or event-focused interviews. For example, Oral histories would be conducted with workers about a strike, uh, which is an event, or about growing up in a mining town, which is an experience, or they would do a life history interview where they would begin with the childhood or perhaps their parents or their grandparents and then take it up to the present. We are interested in people's memories of their lives, in the stories they tell about their lives. We are interested in people's experiences. We are not interviewing them as experts of certain subjects, but rather we are interviewing them as the experts of their own lives. And so um, oral history interviews are similar in some regards to interviews, life history interviews that are being done in other social sciences, other qualitative social sciences. One of the major differences is that we archive interviews. So we uh, put a lot of emphasis on the audio quality of the interviews, 
which not only makes it easier to transcribe, but also makes these interviews into documents that can be used by filmmakers, by radio producers, uh, by other researchers. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better idea of um, some of the different approaches to oral history and kind of its broader context um, within kind of the field of interviewing. So what I'm going to do um, before we get into the heart of the session, I just want to ask uh, a little bit about your background, um, where you're tuning in from today, um, what are your expectations for this workshop? Um, so the first question I have is, um, are you from Newark? And if not, where are you tuning in from? So if everyone can just take a quick moment, uh, put in the chat where you're uh, tuning in from today, and we'll get a better sense of you know, how to kind of make sure that this workshop is relevant uh, to you and your communities. So we see we have folks here from New York City, New Brunswick. Shout out to the, all the Newark natives here. Um, Texas, California, Jersey City, East Orange, Illinois, born and raised in Newark, wonderful Sussex County and Passaic. Lots of folks from New Jersey. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, we're really glad to make this uh, you know, workshop accessible to everyone uh, you know, local to, to our state, but we're really grateful to have others tuning in from across the country as well. Um, my second question is, uh, do you have a background in oral history? Uh, what, do you, what do you know about this interviewing technique? Um, just share a little bit about why you're here today um, in the chat. Great. We have some, some students here in public history um, looking to get to know a little bit more about the, this interview practice. Um, others here that are very experienced uh, in, in conducting oral history interviews already. I'm glad to talk through um, some of the kind of basics on technique and we'll also be hosting a broader uh, oral history boot camp in November that uh, we'll share a little bit more about later in the session. Um, so those that are experienced, um, we're really grateful to have you here and we'll be going more in depth in um, Career Newark's future programming this fall. So some other folks here that um, work a lot with the LGBTQ community and are looking to bring kind of oral history practice into those spaces. Obviously you're in good company here um, and others that are working on you know, really expanding historical perspectives, bringing in the personal information that you can collect in an oral history interview. I see we have some librarians and let's see, PhD students. Um, very excited to just have such a diverse group of people that are, are tuning in. And uh, we encourage you uh, throughout the session today, if anything really triggers a particular thought or interest of yours, please feel free to write it in the chat. Um, We'll have a question and answer session kind of at the end of each uh, module um, in the workshop. So we'll gather all those questions together and make sure that we um, you know, get to really dive into some of your interests as well. Um, and the last question I have here is, um, are you interested in volunteering with Queer Newark? Um, if there's anyone out there, a student, a community member, um, if you want to get involved either with kind of helping us uh, you know, build our collection, conducting interviews yourself, or if you might have a story to share, um, please feel free to, to write it in the chat um, and we'll be sending a survey along after this workshop as well so that you'll learn a little bit more about how to be involved and you can you know, share your contact information at that time. So um, please feel free, if you know at this moment that you, you wanna be involved in Queer Newark, feel free to you know, show us some love in the chat. All right, um, so just kind of wrapping things up there um, to, to give some more information about myself. Um, I'm an oral historian uh, by profession. I've been working in the field for almost 10 years. I'm currently a PhD student in the American Studies program. And as a, a graduate assistant with Queer Newark, um, I help uh, kind of coordinate the, the volunteer initiatives, which is why I ask those questions if anyone would like to kind of get involved. Um, and I also help manage some of the archive. Um, so we're, you're in great company here with other representatives from the project. I see some of our directors. Um, want to give a shout out to uh, Timothy Stewart Winter. We have uh, Christina Strasberger. And then I'm going to hand it on over to Kristen Scorsone to share a little bit more about um, kind of their background and experience with the project as well.
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen, uh, they, them pronouns. And um, so I've been uh, with the Korean Oral History Project since 2015. I began, um, I became a team member then as a master's student in history at Rutgers Newark. And I've stayed on, I'm now um, a PhD uh, candidate in American studies. And my research and writing um, and just like academic career or journey has always centered queer Newark um, and the stories contained within our archives. Um, and queer Newark, uh, just to give you a big bit of background on the project for those who aren't familiar, started in 2011 thanks to um, Christina Strasberger, um, who's here with us, and uh, historian and professor at Rutgers Newark, Burl Satter, and writer activist Darnell Moore. And what they did was they came uh, in 2011, they went out to the community and, ha and, and hosted a range, um, a series of uh, listening sessions to see what the community, the LGBTQ community in Newark wanted out of a historical project. And the consensus, consensus came that they wanted an oral history um, project because they wanted uh, the stories of folks in and of Newark to be told, to be remembered, to be preserved as part of the, the historical narrative, um, because otherwise it, it isn't, and it, it and it will, you know, as people age and go on, they you know these stories are lost, and because queer history and trans history in general is left out of so much mainstream history, this is obviously so important because um, once these people are gone, this history is gone, right? So. Queer Newark is in that way very much a reclamation project. And so aside from having all these oral histories, we do have um, a bit of an archive of documents. Um, if you look at our website, we have uh, bibliography as well as a timeline of queer clubs uh, and bars and spaces in Newark um, that are important to the history. Um, we have an exhibit that's, that travels when, when, you know, when it's safe to do so. And um, as well as a podcast and walking tours. Um, so we try to like bring this history in as many ways as we can to as many people as we can, can reach. And um, so Erica, um, with that, if you wouldn't mind, we're gonna just play a very quick portion of uh, a video that our awesome co-director, Timothy Stewart Winter created. Um, I won't play the whole thing, probably just a couple of minutes, but it'll give you an idea of sort of the project and also um, some of the voices contained in our archives and the types of stories we are getting at. So what you'll see is a series of sort of like photos uh, with some of these oral history clips overlaid over it. I think you need to unmute yourself, Erica, in order to hear the sound. Maybe. There you go. Um, and I'm certain that for those who were on the other side of my sermons or prayers or whatever else, <laughs> they were always so shocked. I bought a little <laughs> statue of uh, Michelangelo David, just thinking this is a beautiful thing, you know, without realizing what a cliche it was. Um, and the guy who sold it to me, there were two men who ran a little bookstore that had a, a few, you know, decorative items. Um, I think it was Halsey Street, and I'm sure they were gay, too. I took my children, they were babies, to Independence Park in the Airmount section in Newark. And I went to the water fountain. My son was thirsty. They were both thirsty. So I took them to the water fountain. And there was this girl standing there. And I thought she was with her kids, but it turns out that she worked for the park. And when I went over there, she helped me pick up my son so that he could drink water. And her hand kind of touched my hand, and I just lost it because she was so cute with her little tool belt. Early on, before kindergarten, it wasn't attracted to men. Um, I, I was attracted to big t-shirts to make it look like I had a dress on. I remember these things. My partner who is Italian, white, this was uh, mostly 
white neighborhood. When we came out of the club, there was a, uh, I forget the context under which some altercation was going on between some words and whatnot between my partner and somebody else, one of the folks who were at the club, outside the club, whatnot, uh, some derogatory stuff. And so we got in the car and proceeded to drive off and um, didn't realize until we got home that there was a little bullet hole in the car, in the windshield of the car. And apparently someone had shot, it was a, like a BB gun or something that was, wasn't substantial, but uh, they had shot at us. And so, of course, I never went back there. It was a mostly white neighborhood. It's I mean, three, three nine in North Fifth Street. That was the during that time. That was what we call Imperial Alley country. But then I met my first girlfriend actually at Club Zanzibar, and it was during that crazy time period. Um, and you know that was just when I was Pandora's box right there, and it was it was done. She was dancing to um, was that all it was by Jean. Kim, Jean Carnes, and I'll never forget, like she was up again, she was just dancing with herself in a mirror and the room was like this smoky blue and, and, and it seemed like we were the only two people in the entire space, but I know there had to be more people there, but you know, that's how I remember it. And then she turned around and that was the end of that. Thank you, Erica, thank you for playing that. Um, I hope, um, you know, that video is available on our website. So if you want to watch the rest, of course, feel free to. And um, I just think that 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 Queer Nook's history is so great because it's such a multiracial history. Um, and it really encapsulates folks from a lot of different parts of the community. Um, and so I hope that you'll check out our interviews more because there's like some really, really fantastic stories and, and life experiences there. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Erica, who is going to take you through the overview of this workshop and um, get us started. Um, so thank you so much, Kristen. Um, to just give an, a breakdown of, of what exactly we're gonna be working through today. Um, we're first gonna be looking at the kind of preparation that's required um, in building out an oral history project. Then, uh, like I mentioned before, we're gonna run through some different techniques before applying those techniques um, to a practice session where we're gonna go into breakout rooms, um, get to try some interviewing uh, with each other. And finally, we're gonna think about kind of the applications of oral history, um, the many diverse ways that it can be used, um, ways that it brings communities together and ways that it also helps, uh, you know, document such important aspects of history and share it with the public. Um, so we'll have, uh, we'll be running till 3 p.m. today. Um, and each section is gonna be about, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, um, and we'll, we'll wrap up a few minutes early so you can ask uh, all of your questions at the end. So um, the first uh, kind of portion, again, looking at preparation. And what's really important is when you're starting to think about going out and conducting oral histories, um, you need to find ways to, to be inspired. Um, so maybe there's already kind of a question on your mind. Maybe there's um, an aspect of community history or an era of history that you're, you're really passionate about. But what we recommend doing first is really you know, digging into uh, family photo albums, especially if you're wanting to record some of your own family history, um, bring out those photo albums, start to hear you know, a little bit of the stories, think about what you know already kind of about this subject um, and how an interview could help enhance kind of your, your understanding and context around it. You might also wanna do just a really quick online search, um, see what books are out there that have been written, what articles um, you, know, you can read online that are related to your particular uh, topic that you're interested in. Obviously we have librarians, um, the most wonderful people here today with us. Um, go to your local libraries or your university library, um, talk with librarians, um, see what resources are available um, you know, to you within the community. Um, and really think about, you know, kind of newspapers, especially if you're thinking uh, you might be doing kind of a historical interview series. Uh, think about what newspapers are available, what organizational records, um, you know, if you're working with a particular group that has, uh, you know, was founded in the 1960s, that's, you have 60 years worth of, of records that you could look through that would enhance the kind of questions you ask within the interviews. And then there's also official archives. Um, you know, there may be kind of community-based records that you could go and consult very easily. 
there might be digital records uh, if you're part of a particular group that you know are on uh, in Google Drive. But then there's official institutional archives um, where you can really kind of dig in to um, some different material on the subject that you're interested in. So you got to just put in some time, do some research, um, and get inspired about what kind of topic you'd like to pursue in your interviews. And the next step is really kind of envisioning your dream for your project. Um, what is the key purpose that you want to pursue? Uh, what are those research questions that, that come to mind that you might like to ask on a project level? Um, you know, obviously there's gonna be a question list we're gonna think about for each individual interview, but on a project level, what are you really trying to get at um, by you know, launching this particular interview initiative? Why is this history uh, especially important to document or share? Um, has it not been kind of recorded um, and included in the historical record in the past? Is there a particular community that you want to reach um, by sharing this information? And that leads us into thinking about kind of the audience for your project. Um, you know, who are the kind of people that you want to interview? Um, who would you want to share these stories with? Why is that important? And then um, just kind of leading through a couple of other important questions. You know, how do you want to record the interviews? What is the final product that you're hoping to um, create based on all the oral histories? And thinking logistically, you know, do you need to go out there and, and raise some money um, to support your work, um, to pay people for their, their contributions to the project? How long will it take to launch uh, the kind of initiative that you're envisioning? All of these um, kind of different questions can impact the way that you create you know, just a document that we think of as a project design. Um, so just kind of jotting down your notes along the way and um, thinking about how the project will be structured from the start is really important in um, you know, meeting expectations of a community and really having a very clear sense of, of where you want to go um, in how you kind of design the, the core of the project. So I'm just gonna go into um, some specifics here. Um, about you know, how to really kind of build out that structure. The first one is um, thinking at the bottom here about teamwork. So if you're working with different communities, um, you wanna make sure that you know, whether or not you are a member of that community, that there are uh, kind of structures in place where it's a co-created process, where those community members have agency in how the project is created and they're, they're contributing to kind of the vision that you have in store for it. Um, so sometimes that means, you know, convening a community meeting or kind of bringing it up in a discussion that's already taking place to make sure that there's, there's buy-in and that there's kind of uh, support and collaboration for every step of the way. You also want to think about, um, you know, the kind of people that will be conducting the interviews. Um, you know, it could be if you're uh, an educator, maybe you're, you're working with your students. Um, if it's, uh, you know, an intergenerational community, Maybe you want to have, um, you know, again, young people interviewing elders, and that can kind of bring the group together in a, in a very interesting and impactful way. Um, you want to think about if there's any uh, professional interviewers that you would want to hire, uh, if there's additional trainings you'd want to offer, kind of similar to this one. And of course, uh, Queer New York is here as a resource if you want to talk through any of these different considerations within your own project. The second um, kind of logistical uh, element to, to think about is the kind of equipment that you're going to use. Um, so obviously we're conducting this workshop over Zoom today and that's kind of been, been the, the world that many of us have existed in uh, for the past year and a half. Um, and it is a great resource in terms of, you know, bringing people together over vast distances, um, people that may not otherwise be able to meet in person normally. Um, but there are some concerns with Zoom as well. Um, so there are other kind of video conferencing softwares out there that are available. One that comes to mind is Zencast. Um, maybe the community that you're working with isn't so comfortable with, with using computers. So you might want to set up like a, a phone conference line instead for an interview. Um, you might want to think about if you're connecting an, an in-person interview when it becomes safe to do so, you know, what kind of audio recorder or video camera would you use? Um, and there's some great resources out there. Um, there's a resource called Ask Doug, which kind of links you through um, options for thinking about, you know, what, what is your budget? What is the purpose of the interviews? And that allows you to really think about that kind of equipment that you want to use. Um, so we'll, we'll be sure to share kind of a list of all those resources at the end of the workshop. Um, additionally, it's important to think about kind of long-term preservation of the materials that you collect. Um, 
because we're kind of conducting interviews um, digitally, you know, in, in our modern day and era, um, it's important that you have resources to back up those digital files. Um, so that's everything from, you know, making sure that you have like a, an SD card if you're using an audio recorder like this. Um, if you're conducting, you know, an interview where you're recording it on your computer, yet that you have enough storage. Um, and it also means uh, potentially you know, partnering with an archive that could help uh, you know, preserve your material long-term. And finally, I'll just mention that um, you know, there's lots of great cloud storage services out there. Um, we at Queer Newark tend to use Google Drive. Um, there's also Dropbox and other forms of backup of files. But it's really important to kind of think about that preservation plan um, because digital files can disappear very easily. Um, and especially if they're not organized, um, they can kind of get out of hand very quickly and you, it may be difficult to kind of locate everything. So just recommend kind of thinking about um, what preservation might look like for you and your project. And finally, I'll just wrap up here um, by talking a little bit about the, the final products um, that you might want to create with oral history. So, you know, oral histories, they certainly can be used in traditional, you know, history books um, as a way of kind of rewriting and democratizing the past. But you might also want to think about, you know, kind of creative outlets for them. Um, could you put the interviews in a podcast? Could you create a documentary? Um, would you be interested in creating kind of community-led walking tour, an exhibition? Um, oral histories are used to create uh, theater and dance productions. There's so many different kind of creative applications um, that we're, we're glad to kind of brainstorm with you further about your particular interests. Um, but thinking about what that final product is uh, that you're trying to create is important in terms of structuring the interviews in a way that gets you there. Um, and additionally, like I mentioned, keeping things organized is so essential, as they say, keeping all your ducks in a row. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to just, uh, you know, briefly share is that as you're kind of creating these different resources, um, you're thinking through different levels of your project. It's important to kind of keep all those files together in one place. Um, so we talked a little bit about all those different questions that might go into creating a project design. Um, you know, make sure you just have kind of like a running Word document, a Google document. We can keep track of all those thoughts as they develop. It might also be helpful um, to share some information, you know, with your whole team. Uh, if you're using kind of a collaborative uh, software, uh, like a cloud storage system, you know, make sure you have a Google Drive set up so that all the other collaborators have access to those files. Some other areas that you might want to think about creating is um, a spreadsheet where you can kind of keep track of all the contact information of the people that you're reaching out to. And you can also um, make sure as you're kind of bringing in all of, of the interviews, let's say you have a team of six people that are out there interviewing in the field, um, you want to make sure that you're kind of keeping track of all the files that are, are coming in as well. So that's what we call kind of the, the core project documents. Um, and I think that's important to have those, whether it's for you know, an, an individual kind of family project um, or whether it's kind of a larger community or institutional level. Um, so again, we're, we're glad to answer some questions about that. Um, I think there might even be some questions in the chat as well um, that we'll, we'll get to at the end of this session. Um, and finally, uh, you know, switching from project documents, that's really on the you know, the large level to the individual interview files themselves. Some different areas that are important to develop for your project are what we call um, kind of a biographical uh, data sheet. And that is essentially a way, um, you know, especially if you're conducting many interviews, where you can just have that very basic information written down. You know, what is the person's name? What pronouns do they use? Um, what's their contact information? Some key kind of biographical uh, data that you can kind of keep track of across all of the different interviews. I also want to mention here that um, oral history, like I mentioned, it's a very specific kind of interview technique and, and process. Um, so it's important to develop a, what we call a consent form so that the person who is being interviewed, um, that they know exactly what project they're contributing their stories to, what the uses of those interviews will be. And in oral history, we think about kind of the ethics behind that as well. Um, so anytime that someone shares their story and then isn't comfortable in like keeping those stories as, as part of that, that project, 
um, they always have the ability to kind of withdraw their interview um, and have that agency and make that decision on their own. So that's something that is important to communicate um, to people that you're interviewing, as well as putting in the consent form, really making sure that kind of all the protections um, for, for people, meeting them where they are and what their own kind of safety considerations are is, is really important. Um, I'll just really briefly mention that, um, you know, some other documents that are helpful to develop, uh, if you're doing audio interviews, especially and taking photos within the interview space, having just a, a, what we call a photo log to kind of keep track of each image and create a description is important. And also having a way to kind of summarize all of the interview content afterwards is helpful. So again, we're happy to share kind of samples of these documents and, and think through these different resources and how they uh, apply to your particular project. So um, just kind of wrapping up this section. Um, so once you've really thought about, you know, what are, what are your key questions? What is the project design? Um, and thinking about, you know, how do you build out all of these documents that help support, uh, you know, this, this project that you're implementing? Then it's time to really think about who you're going to invite to, to be involved. Um, so I want to stress here again, we, I know we have folks that are tuning in, um, they're interested in connecting family interview projects. So really think, you know, make sure that you interview the eldest members of your family first, or those that, um, you know, may, ha may have health considerations. And um, I can say some of the, the biggest regrets can be if you know that there's an amazing story in your family and you don't get to record it. So I really recommend you know, thinking about all of those kind of elders um, within your family and community that may be important to uh, record their stories of at this time. Um, in addition to those, those elders, you know, really thinking about what we call like witnesses to history. Um, so people that went through a specific historical event and maybe their own experiences haven't been shared. You know, they haven't been recorded in the historical record in the past. Um, so making sure again, that you do kind of all the background research required around that particular event, but ensuring that everyday people's stories are included um, and documented are, are really important. And maybe you're, you know, working at a particular institution where there's, uh, you know, experts on a particular field um, that you wanna bring together. Uh, you know, really thinking about people being experts on their own kind of life stories, but they also might have a particular profession that they're, uh, you know, an expert in. And that's important to ensure that they get invited to a particular project as well. That's kind of the focus of your initiative. And finally, um, ensuring that, you know, when you conduct interviews within a community, that it's actually representative of that community. So um, again, this comes back to having meetings with community stakeholders, um, building in ways to equitably uh, collaborate within a community. You wanna make sure that all different kind of representatives at that group are included and that no one is um, you know, excluded from, from participating in the project. And how to, to get kind of all of these different people involved. Um, you, know, you can certainly go through your own existing connections um, within your own family or your community or you can go through a referral process as well. So maybe you conduct uh, you know, your first interview with someone and then the final question you ask at the end uh, is, you know, is there anyone else that I should really interview for this project? Um, and that's what we call like snowball sampling where it, just the referral network kind of um, you know, helps you scale up the initiative. I'll also just kind of wrap up here by saying that um, you know, other ways to get the word out, certainly you can go, uh, you know, create flyers, um, do some publicity and like local newspapers, newsletters. Um, for those that, you know, maybe tech savvy, you can do kind of some social media blasts. We tend to do that with Queer Newark, um, you know, a couple times a year to really ensure that anyone who's connected with our, our initiative, that they have, uh, you know, they see that we're looking for interviewers and interviewees um, on social media. And finally, I'll just mention, um, you know, if it's folks that you may not have been in touch with in the past, making sure that the invitations you sent are really personalized. Um, so again, if you're trying to create a project that interviews a specific level of kind of professional experts, um, make sure you're not just sending out an email that's like an email blast. It actually has to kind of engage the person and show them that you know about them, you know, a little about their story and their work. Um, and so that's why these, uh, you know, invitations have to be personalized. 
And um, I'll just wrap up here by saying that um, if you are based at a university, there's uh, kind of some human subjects research um, protections that are in place. Um, and that's through the Institutional Review Board. Um, so we definitely recommend uh, you know, learning some more information about that at your particular institution and seeing if there's an oral history exemption as well. Um, because sometimes oral history is not seen as human subjects research, but rather kind of like a documentary process. So just do a little bit more research um, in your particular area. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just kind of open the floor at the moment. Let's take a, a quick look at the chat. Um, and Kristen, were there any kind of questions that popped up over the past few minutes as I was going through this section? Um, so far, I've noticed that I, I really like appreciated uh, Tiffany McKnight's comment that I think oral history is a great way to learn authentic history of specific communities that documents can't always convey. I think that's a, a really great observation. Um, as far as questions, um, people are interested in, in recording equipment resources, for sure. Um, and I have not seen um, any other questions yet, but I want to encourage folks, you know, if anything comes up as we're going along, I'm going to keep my eye on the chat so your question won't be missed and I will definitely, we'll definitely pause as we go along to, to attend to any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so I just put the, the name in the chat. It's called uh, Ask Doug. Um, Doug Boyd is an, an oral historian at the University of Kentucky, and he's kind of gone through um, and I guess reviewed all the different equipment and kind of created this wonderful tool where, you know, based on your budget and the particular interests um, of your interview project, you can kind of you know check a box and it, it recommends some equipment to you. Um, Maybe Kristen or, or Christina, if you don't mind, uh, kind of looking for that link and adding it in. Um, and if not, I'll find it at the, the end of the workshop. But um, I definitely recommend checking out Ask Doug. All right. Um, so I'm going to transition into kind of the real heart of, of this session. And that is around interview technique. Um, so what are some approaches that you can take um, to make sure that you're asking effective questions and really organizing your oral history in a way that um, you know, meets the needs of your project and also that of the person you're interviewing. So um, the first recommendation is, uh, like we say here, show some respect. Um, so that means, you know, like I mentioned with the kind of personalized approach uh, to inviting people to be involved in, in your project, um, you also wanna conduct some personalized research. Um, essentially know about the person before you even reach out to them so that you can have an informed conversation and that it shows them respect in the process as well. Um, especially if you're being referred to them by someone else, you know, make sure that you cite that you know, in, in the, the message you sent to them, let them know how you got in touch or how you received their contact information. Um, after you conduct some personalized research, which again, you know, if, if they, that could be every, anything from if it's a really kind of notable person, uh, you know, reading their book, or that could mean uh, going through some, some family photo albums and, and papers, um, and just kind of getting an idea of the types of questions you might want to ask. Um, so that's, you know, that personalized research is important in putting that question list together. Um, and it can essentially be, you know, just what are the key topics that you would want to ask this particular person kind of based on the information that you already know or that that you you know gathered through a very quick search um, so that question list can again inform some of the early conversations you have with them it shows them respect that you've kind of taken the time to, to understand them and a little bit of their life story and then as you reach out to them um, Make sure you introduce yourself, um, share a little bit about the project that you're envisioning um, and why you're you know, contacting them specifically to be involved. Um, and that again, makes them feel like you know, they have a story that's worth telling and, and worth hearing um, and that you're actually really engaged in learning from them and their experiences. Um, yeah, I just want to chime in to say, I did an interview with a woman who at the end was like, wow, that's the first time I've ever told my story and I usually am the one who does the listening in my friend group and in my family group. So this was like, and I, this was the first time I actually was the, the one to speak. And I just thought that was really interesting and powerful. So I agree with what you're saying. 
Yeah, for sure. I think that, um, you know, especially in our society today, there's a lot of talking, not so much listening. Um, and that's why the oral history uh, space is such a kind of beautiful one where people can open up and really feel that they're able to share their life story in a way that resonates with them. Um, so yeah, like Kristen mentioned, I think that you, you often get those kind of little side conversations and commentaries that these are stories that they you know, may not have even shared with their own closest family members. Um, so I think that's, that's a really powerful kind of you know, aspect of the way that oral history is structured. Um, after you got in touch with someone and, and introduced yourself, um, you know, if they are open to being interviewed for your project, um, this is what we call the next step is holding a pre-interview conversation. Um, so essentially, you know, maybe you're in touch with them over email or uh, social media, um, and you want to have a little bit more of a formal conversation so that you can really make sure that you understand each other and that they have a better sense for your project. Um, so a pre-interview conversation could be a phone call, um, it could be an in-person meeting, of course, done safely, um, it could be a video chat, and it's essentially a way, um, again, to explain your project, to build some rapport, uh, get to know them a little bit, um, and also to go through some more of those logistics we talked about. So it's important to um, talk through that consent form um, that you dealt for your project, um, which again, it's, you know, provides a full outline of how their interview is going to be used. Um, you want to share a little bit about, you know, others that you, you have uh, already connected oral histories with, and a little bit about that final product as well. You know, if, if the interview is being used in a public event, you want to let them know that you're, they're going to be invited to that event. Um, if it's going to be published in a book, you need to be in touch with them about like how essentially what the consent process will be as you're writing that book. Um, so that pre-interview conversation is a really wonderful opportunity to kind of talk through every level of the project. Erica, um, we have a question on that specifically. Um, can you suggest any media or liability release form templates that we can potentially use or they can potentially use? Yeah, I, I think we can definitely um, share some, some different kind of um, templates uh, based, maybe, I don't, I don't know if Queer New York specifically will be open to sharing a copy of the release form, but um, I definitely have kind of a whole set of them that I can share. Um, I'll just mention briefly that, um, you know, there are different considerations around shared copyright, um, licensing to the material, um, and kind of distribution uh, of interviews, um, and even the preservation plan and, and archives as well. Um, so, I'll be glad to, um, you know, welcome to be in contact with me to talk through those, those different areas, um, but we'll be glad to share some, some templates, um, you know, as follow-up resources from this workshop. So thanks for that question. Um, and also, um, you know, one other area I'll just mention on, on the pre-interview conversation is, um, especially if you're connecting the interview online, um, you wanna make sure that you're doing a tech check at that time. So, um, you know, if it's gonna be on Zoom, make sure that you're inviting the person to the Zoom setting, um, going through a little bit of, uh, I guess, te technological considerations. So if they have a pair of headphones, um, you know, ask them to, to use that um, and make sure that the Wi-Fi is steady enough so that the um, you know, interview can go smoothly. All that's really important in this kind of pre-interview phone call. Um, and kind of moving Forward, you know, after you've had that, that initial conversation, um, you want to make sure that you're scheduling the official oral history at a mutually convenient time. And I mentioned that because obviously people live very uh, busy lives um, and you want to make sure that you're kind of setting an expectation that this interview, it is long form. It's not just like, you know, uh, an interview you'd see in a, a talk show. It's not five minutes. This might be an hour and a half or two hours of, of someone's time. And so you want to make sure you're doing, you're scheduling it in the middle of, of their day or on a weekend um, so that they don't have kind of other commitments that are either before or after it. Um, and sometimes that's difficult to do. Sometimes you have to be kind of flexible, um, but that's just one consideration is that the process of sharing these stories, um, you know, it can be very vulnerable and people need some time to kind of process um, before and afterwards. So that's just why I recommend, you know, schedule that, that interview session at a time that works well for you both and that you don't have kind of, you know, other events that are butting up against it. And finally, wrapping up here, um, you know, really thinking about, you know, you initially created that, that personalized question list um, that applies to 
you know, the person's life based on some of the research you did, after you have a conversation with them in the pre-interview, um, you know, go back and revise that question list and really think about, you know, what further research you need to do um, and what further questions have arisen after that, you know, pre-interview phone call. Um, and all of that is really important in just making sure that you're kind of structuring the oral history session um, in a way that, you know, gets through the kind of questions that, that you want to ask and that are important to your project. Um, so I'll just mention here, you know, this is, uh, I'm talking about kind of the personalized uh, interview outline, but you should also have um, an interview question list at a project level that really allows you to connect the different themes across the interviews. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, um, a little bit further in this section where we get into the kind of the question formation. Um, but it's important to kind of create these interview guides, um, you know, especially if you're not the only one connecting oral histories, maybe you have other interviewers involved. It's really important to kind of have that, that project level um, document so that there's some kind of continuity and themes can be pulled out across the different interviews. Um, so kind of moving into all the, the preparation stage uh, for the interview process. Um, so it's really important, you know, on the, the days uh, before your interview session, make sure that you've really taken some time to assemble all of your materials that are required. So that means, you know, if it's going to be in person, um, printing out copies of all of the documents. Um, so again, that's the consent form. Maybe that's the, the photo log. Um, you're going to be doing some photography making sure you have any materials that relate to your project um, that you can bring along with you to the interview session, um, you know, any brochures that you've developed or any kind of publicity that you think is meaningful for the um, interviewee to have a copy of and you know, to further understand the project. What's also really important is to think about um, all of the equipment that you need. Um, and this is, this is essential whether you're going in person or whether it's an online um, oral history. Uh, you know, make sure you have extra copies of, of storage cards, maybe even have a backup recorder. Um, sometimes, you know, in addition to using kind of one of these audio recorders, you might want to bring your phone too. Uh, just being able to have that, that backup going on in the background is really important because you never know when there might be some technological issue. Um, same thing with Zoom. Um, you know, there are ways to record the interviews to the cloud. Sometimes there's different security considerations around that where you want to be really careful, um, you know, if it's a sensitive topic, um, if the person prefers to be anonymous, you might want to really look at some of the security protections within Zoom and see if it makes sense to put it in the cloud or to record directly on your computer. And that, again, kind of goes back to the idea of making sure you have enough storage space um, and that all of these different areas are uh, kind of checked ahead of, of your interview day. One other thing I'll, I'll really mention that's so important is uh, rest up ahead of time. Um, sometimes that's tough with the busy lives that we live um, and even, you know, kind of in the flurry of preparing for an interview, but trying to get enough sleep, um, make sure you have, you know, gotten some food in your system before going to the interview. It's very important, especially because it's like a long form process. Um, there are different techniques that you can use, you know, uh, kind of grounding approaches. Um, you know, if you're arriving at someone's home, really take a few minutes before you, you come to their, their space um, and, you know, walk slowly or, uh, you know, go to a park and just kind of decompress a little bit um, because that's very important before you sit for hours and really listen to someone's, um, you know, deep life experiences. You have to just care for yourself a little bit in that process as well. And I'll just run through these uh, last few items. You know, make sure you know where you're going. <laughs> um, if you're going in person, develop a travel plan, have their contact information on file, arrive on time. Again, that shows respect um, or communicate if there's some reason or if you're running behind schedule. Make sure that um, you're creating a welcoming, accessible and inclusive environment. Um, so thinking about the kind of spaces that you're booking out for the interview. And as you arrive uh, in that oral history session, you know, really welcome them into that space as well. Um, take some time to just chat with them ahead of time before you, you know, hit the record button. Uh, um, to that point, Erica, we have a, a great question um, from Christine. Don't people sometimes tell you the good stuff during a pre-interview and then they may be reluctant to repeat the story or, in, or repeat it in the same level of detail during the recorded interview? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, 
So I guess my recommendation is when you're going into the pre-interview process, um, make sure that you kind of let them know, you know, you want some basic information, um, but to please not tell their story <laughs> in that moment. Um, so maybe you can ask them, you know, what are, uh, what are some specific stories that you know I shouldn't miss in this interview? But then just kind of say, please don't tell them to me now because we want them fresh. We want them to be like on the recording. Um, so yeah, that's where I'd say like definitely include them in that process of kind of creating your, your interview outline, but just, you know, kind of create some expectations that, you know, you need this on, on the record essentially. Yeah, I'd be like, don't waste this story on me. Just <laughs> hold, it, hold it for a second. And um, I'm definitely gonna note to, to ask you about this. For sure, yeah, yeah. And I love that suggestion that Kristen put um, in, in the chat uh, about drinking some hot tea beforehand. Um, it's nice and calming and also, you know, soothing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love it. Um, and that I think will make you feel kind of refreshed and relaxed, um, you know, before you go into the interview space. So I think that's a great recommendation. Maybe not too much caffeine too. <laughs> Maybe not a big cup of coffee, um, but tea, tea sounds like a great approach to it. <laughs> um, so again, kind of coming into that, that interview space, maybe you have some, uh, you know, refreshments available to the narrator if you're the one setting up that space. Um, you wanna do your tech check of the equipment, get all your backups in order. Um, and then as you're starting the interview, you wanna make sure that you're recording an introduction. Um, and that essentially, you know, if someone is listening to your digital file decades down the line, you want to make sure that that recording states the, the name of the person being interviewed, your own name as an interviewer, the date, the place um, that the interview is taking, you know, you're taking part in it. You want to share what session number it is. So maybe you're going back and interviewing the person multiple times. Um, you also want to share what the project is, or the purpose of, of this interview. Um, so that's what we call just a recording introduction. I like it to have it printed out personally, just like a little note card, so I remember to read it. Um, and you also want to make sure that you um, ask the narrator th their pronouns and their pronunciation of their name, and maybe even asking them to pronounce it first, um, because that's that's really important again in, in showing respect um, and being inclusive. And also, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to misidentify them in in this interview um, down the line. Uh, so it's it's really important to kind of get all that information in place, uh, you know, before you even hit record. Some other areas, um, you know, you want to thank them for their time. Uh, that's really important throughout the entire process. And really ask a, an effective opening, kind of hard-hitting question to open up the space um, and to make them feel kind of welcome as well. Um, so maybe I'll pause here because I think the next slide is kind of about these different interview techniques. I'm just going to check the chat. Are there any kind of questions uh, at this time, you know, just kind of based on this information we've covered. I think we have got them all, unless any new ones want to pop up now. Feel free. Great. Awesome. All right. So kind of transitioning over from, you know, thinking about all the all that preparation, all that hard work that's kind of required ahead of the interview process. Now you want to really think about your, your question style. Um, so like I mentioned, it's, it's important to, uh, you know, really take an open-ended approach in, in the questions that you pose. Um, but that kind of goes back to thinking about that initial interview question list that you create. So like I mentioned at the, at the project level, you know, you really should have a list of different themes or questions that are asked across all the different oral histories. And on the individual interview level, it's important to develop that as well. But when we're thinking about the, the question styles and what makes oral history different from other forms of, of interviewing, um, these are just some different kind of tools I'd recommend checking out. You don't have to read all of these at the moment. You don't have to memorize kind of the ways that I've, I've framed them. But it can give you a little bit of an idea of um, some different approaches you can take in how you ask questions. Um, so just going into a couple of them here you know, um, it can be very kind of biographical uh, question to start the interview off. So can you tell me a little bit of, about what your household was like growing up? Um, maybe you'd want to even start before that, you know, asking them to share uh, about their family, um, about their, the story of their name. I heard that's, a, that's kind of a, you know, a, a way to open up the interview space and have an interesting conversation. 
maybe you want to ask them not just about the start of their own life, but what they know about their family history before they were born. Um, and that's really a way to just kind of kind of come into this interview space together and recognize the, the full kind of life story of someone and the ways that it extends beyond their self to their family and their community. Um, I'll just mention a couple other approaches here. You know, if maybe they, they mention a particular term that you're unfamiliar with. Um, so it's what we call like a definitional question. So the example we have here is, you know, can you explain what it meant to be a latchkey kid? You know, that's a term that you know, maybe it was popular a few decades ago, and maybe a young person wouldn't know what that means today. So asking, you know, someone to define a particular term is, is really important for your own self, but also for kind of the historical record. Other approaches, you know, asking them for examples, um, asking them for specific details, um, asking them to kind of describe a particular story, um, really embed themselves back in that moment. Um, and think about kind of all the five senses, you know, what were they seeing, feeling, smelling, all of these different areas make for a really interesting story and allows for a more kind of like accurate rendering of, of that historical event. I'll just mention a couple other approaches here. Um, so when I talk about kind of open-ended question styles, um, essentially that means you don't wanna be asking for asking a question that would lead to only a yes or no answer. Um, and you also don't want to be directing someone in a particular um, way of answering the question. Um, so that means, you know, you want to kind of leave all of your own biases at the door. You want to make sure that you're not bringing your own opinions about something into the, the exact question style, the way that you're asking, um, you know, them to describe their own life. Um, so some approaches to kind of navigating away from this, what we call closed question style to more of an open-ended one is, really listening into their narrative, um, thinking about the stories that they're sharing, making sure you're asking follow-up questions based on them. So one approach here is, um, you know, mentioning a particular story that they already shared and then asking some related question to it. So an example is, you know, you mentioned that your grandmother cooked for the whole family on Sundays. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? What kind of meals would she cook? What was that kind of environment like? Um, in terms of the, the family gathering. In addition, just kind of like listening into their stories and, and picking up kind of key details that you want to follow up on. You can also bring in, um, you know, different questions that you have from your own research. Um, so if you went to, you know, public library and you looked in the archives at some newspapers, um, you know, bring in some of that information um, so that it maybe it triggers their memory about a particular event that they were a part of. And finally, just kind of wrapping up with, um, you know, Thinking about the emotions, um, thinking about reflections, um, thinking about ways that they can, you know, go out from just the kind of description of the event to actually their own personal impact of that moment. Um, so especially when you're creating like intergenerational interviews, um, asking uh, elders to share their advice to younger generations um, is a really interesting way in kind of wrapping up that interview and, and having a reflective moment. And we all like to, you know, oral historians like to kind of wrap up by saying, um, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Or is there any uh, question that I didn't ask that I should have? And that may end up <laughs> opening up a whole nother set of stories, or maybe that'll allow you to connect a follow-up um, interview session with them at a later point. Um, but it's, it's just a really wonderful way at kind of uh, acknowledging their agency over telling your own story. And also giving them, you know, a moment to kind of reflect and, and add if, if there's anything that you didn't get to in your own kind of interview agenda. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think I, that's happened to me before where I've asked that question and a person responded with a whole other topic that we then realized we should be incorporating into our questions that we, it was sort of an area of opportunity that we had been missing. Um, but because they said, you know, I, hey, I want to talk about such and such, um, we were able to then, um, allow him to expand on what he wanted to say about this particular topic. Uh, in this case, I believe it was about AIDS, um, but in terms of like actual, like um, more of like a very personal, like nitty gritty of like sexual practices and whatnot. And it can be tough as an interviewee to ask people sort of these private questions. I mean, AIDS as a topic is one thing, but to ask about specifics about someone's sex life, that's difficult, but it's a very important part of queer history obviously, I think to um, maybe obviously to the queer community, 
Um, but as interviewees, like sometimes it's, it's, uh, you have to realize like, you have to put your own sort of embarrassment in some ways to the side because, and they can always decline answering that kind of question if they don't want to. But all that to say, like, sometimes they can, these things can open up new avenues for questions you should be asking go, going forward that make sense for the, the sort of history you're pursuing. For sure. Yeah, I love that. Just thinking about, you know, how that question can be really applicable on the individual level. But then, like Kristen said, you know, it may change the whole framework of your project in the process, which I think is really interesting and important. And it allows you to um, ensure that community voices are included in the way that you know the project is structured and the kind of questions you ask. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's a, a great <laughs> example that um, a simple question could really open things up in, in a really interesting and beautiful way. Um, so kind of transitioning away from the, those different question styles to uh, kind of the interview process itself. Um, you know, I mentioned that it's really, it's a, a vulnerable space for people. Um, it's a space where, you know, they you need to make them feel comfortable in, in sharing these personal stories. And they also need to be aware of kind of the protections that are in place through your own project, um, but also some of the safety concerns uh, along the way. And I, I mentioned that just because, um, you know, when you're asking someone to share specific details from their own uh, life, um, there's going to be a lot that comes up throughout the, the course of that interview. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to really kind of focus in on what it means to, to keep open yet stay focused and how you, you structure that kind of interview encounter. Um, so one area, you know, to really keep in mind is that uh, kind of the pacing for the interview. So, you know, gave some different examples of a different question styles, um, and some of them are more effective in kind of opening up the conversation than, than others. Um, so you want to start out like a little bit slow so that the person, uh, you know, gets to, to know you, that they get to share kind of basic information. Um, you know, that's why we kind of recommend taking a chronological approach when you start from the beginning of their life and kind of make your way <laughs> up uh, to the present. Um, and by, by starting at that point, um, hopefully that will make them feel a little bit more comfortable and it'll also kind of ground them in their own kind of, I know, personal journey. Um, so again, that's why I recommend starting off the interview in a way that maybe looks at their childhood, their family history, and then kind of building up over time. Um, so once they become more comfortable, that's when you can ask um, a little bit more of the, the personal or, or hard hitting questions that, that look at specifics of history. And that's where you can really kind of bring in, um, in specific elements from your research. But I mentioned that like this is a, a vulnerable space um, because you know there may be difficult emotions that, that people experience while reliving um, an aspect of their past. Um, we're going to be holding, uh, like I mentioned before, an, or an oral history boot camp uh, where there's going to be a discussion of a trauma informed approach to interviewing, um, and that's really important. You know, in, in, while working with uh, you know historically marginalized communities. Um, where there may be some trauma um, in, you know, individuals past. Um, and certainly it's important to keep these considerations in place on the, a project level and how you design your whole interview initiative as well. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. Um, just to, to um, interject here um, on this point, uh, Christine asked, do you ever have to protect people from revealing things they may be sorry about later? Sometimes when someone is asking and listening to someone's story for the first time, they may open up too much and how do you, uh, protect them. And I can speak to this on a clear Newark level. Um, for us, it's all, always about consent. So like, um, for me, like part of my pre-interview is to say to them, like, um, if you don't want to answer a question, you're not obligated to answer a question um, for any reason at all. And also the way that we um, navigate putting their um, interviews up online, like which is obviously a very public space, a very vulnerable space for folks. We vet every transcript um, personally as the interviewers, but then we also give this transcript or the or the or the audio if they prefer um, to listen rather than read, um, so that they can vet it as well. And they can say to us, hey, I told you this story about my mother that I really don't want in here anymore, or I accidentally 
outed a friend that I realize now I should not have done. Um, or, you know, or even just simple things too. Like I said, the name of a restaurant wrong and I want to add, I want to change that, but we put that in their hands so that they can have an opportunity to redact anything that they are uncomfortable with. And, um, and they get as much time as they need to look at it, you know, like, um, we're not um, going to be writing them to be like, you have to get this back by such and such a date because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big project to even just have to go through your own words, I think, in some ways. So, you know, just be graceful about, um, about that and let people have time to really think about what they've, what they've told you, the stories they've told you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the way we navigate it. For sure. So I think that consent is important at every stage of, of the interview process. So, um, you know, that goes from signing that, or, you know, discussing the original form, make sure they feel comfortable signing it. Um, but also in the interview space, like Kristen said, um, making sure that they know they don't have to answer every single question and that they can also, after the interview is conducted at any point, you know, take out a particular section of an interview or restrict it from public access. All of that is, is really important to like kind of the core ethics um, of oral history. Um, and that sometimes is difficult, you know, as someone who's managing a collection of dozens of interviews, sometimes it's difficult to uh, kind of navigate requests for edits on every single interview, but it's really essential that you build in that, that time and support uh, network, you know, for the narrators, because that's the only way that they will feel comfortable in sharing their story. Um, and it's really the only respectful way in kind of, you know, honoring their own personal experiences. Um, so it's, it's really essential uh, to make sure that you kind of put those protections in place uh, within the consent form, within the ways that you're kind of developing your project. Um, and just kind of thinking a little bit more about, um, you know, those emotions that, that might come up, um, you know, it, it might end up resulting with someone uh, breaking down in tears or maybe getting angry at, at, at you as an interviewer, um, you know, for for asking a question about a, a touchy subject that, that you might have not known was something that was um, sensitive for them. So sometimes it's helpful ahead of the interview, you know, ask them, is there any direction that they'd prefer not to go down? And sometimes they'll end up even opening up in the interview and, and sharing, you know, some of those more uh, sensitive topics, um, but that's because you've made them feel comfortable. Um, and like the, the question, you know, in, in the chat, um, if they decide afterwards that you know they they're okay with sharing with you and they don't want to share with the public yes like we said you know they should have the right to go back and, and to remove that aspect of, of their their story yeah and without a time limit too even if they agree it gets posted and then a year later they're like uh actually no i need this taken down or i need this changed you can be open to it you know for sure um and I guess in terms of, you know, actually navigating those emotions as they come up in the interview space, um, you know, you want to make sure you're protecting yourself as an interviewer, especially if someone is, is sharing, you know, a, a difficult experience with you. Um, you you want to make sure that you kind of are, are in touch with your own emotions through that process. Um, so I mentioned before, you know, some grounding exercises that you could do, um, you know, just putting some kind of attention awareness uh, to your breath. Um, you know, your kind of groundedness within your own body could be important, um, especially while listening to kind of difficult stories. Um, and you also want to think about kind of what resources are available to you and also to the interviewee um, within your community. Um, so if they've shared something that has like triggered uh, something within themselves or, or you've heard a difficult story, um, you want to know what, what kind of mental health resources are there, uh, what kind of support networks there are to kind of debrief afterwards. Um, and I'm sure in the, the trauma-informed workshop, there'll be some additional kind of approaches and resources to that. So come back in November for <laughs> kind of more in-depth conversation. Um, but Kristen, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share um, from your own interview experiences around, uh, you know, that process of, of navigating emotions. Um, yeah, I would just, you know, for me, I definitely try to do that pre-interview where I establish rapport make them feel comfortable. I let them know that I'm going to keep a notebook um, in, in the on the table in front of me and I will jot things down um, just so that they know that I'm not like psychoanalyzing them. I'm literally just like writing little notes like 
they have X number of siblings, let's say, let's say. So I don't, I know to follow up on certain things or not ask things more than once because even though um, Queer New Work has uh, interview guideline questions that are arranged thematically, sometimes you will, um, you know, move around on it, right? You don't want to be a rigid robot that's like, ask question by question by question and and it's not organic or authentic and um and that is also i think speaks to your point of like active listening and um really listening and reacting to the last thing they said rather than trying to like i don't know think six steps ahead or um you know you're really you're on a path along with this person like like you should literally be picturing yourselves walking together and like, you know, you, you probably have like some sort of a plan of like where you want to go, because for us, it's we want Newark's queer history. So, you know, an interviewee may want to suddenly go take us off to uh, Idaho where they lived for like 12 years. And um, so you have to kind of bring them back gently. Um, but yet they may also want to take you down a path of this, you know, time in Newark where they had to get um, surgery on their knee. And you think, oh, gosh, how is this going to be re related relating to our topic? But you have to like, wait a second, because you don't know. And sometimes it turns out, well, they were um, mistreated by a doctor because of their sexuality or treated really well, despite their sexuality, you know, and, and they were fearing mistreatment, you know, so um, it's sort of being um, in the moment with them, like being in that kind of memory with them as much as you can be. And sometimes too, I've noticed like, I've had some people um, at the beginning of the interview see very short clipped answers um, because maybe they're not used to telling stories about themselves or they're very nervous like we all are. And um, sometimes you just have to be patient and, and just keep kind of like plugging along and asking the questions. And I've noticed that if you stay very calm and like, um, you know, chill about it, like it's sort of like eventually they will sort of like relax with you and um, start to give you long and, and longer answers. And I've like I had that with one person that they were very, very, very curt almost. And um, in the end, they were telling me these beautiful stories about being on like an all butch basketball team in the seventies. Like how awesome, you know what I mean? Like this person had, was like, had this inside them, you know what I mean? And um, so, you know, it's just that being patient and, and just like being willing to go for that walk with them. Yeah, that's a lovely way to describe it. So I, I think you're absolutely right that, um, you know, taking kind of active listening, patient approach is, is essential. Remaining open and flexible. You don't have to stick to that interview outline that you created. It's just kind of some guideposts for where you're, you you want to go um, and ways that it kind of connects back to the subject material of, of the project. Um, but really being kind of guiding uh, the, the interview in a way that if someone really goes way off topic, um, you know, finding ways to kind of respectfully bring them back to um, some of your core questions. Um, so that means not interrupting too much. Um, and if you do need to interrupt for clarification, you know, make it at a, a moment where they're taking a breath, taking a break. Um, you also want to be conscious of the interview recording itself. Um, so kind of using nonverbal affirmations, um, you know, nodding your head or looking physically engaged uh, rather than, you know, kind of saying, uh-huh, or, you know, kind of interrupting the recording as you're uh, listening to their story. Yeah, so I always tell people I'm going to look like a bobblehead because I'm going to be like, <laughs> but not trying not to say yeah or um, uh -huh. or if I, I also let them know if I'm looking at the recording, uh, the recording instrument, the, the recorder itself, I'm not, you know, in the sense, like checking my watch, like, oh, this, I'm bored, you know, I'm literally just making sure this is still recording. So they don't feel like I'm rushing them in any, any way. There's also a question in the chat, if you would want me to ask it now, um, that pertains to this. So Abe is asking for family oral histories, is, is it's likely for there to be shared trauma between the interviewer and interviewee, is a level of objectivity important? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I guess what comes to mind for, for me is that if there is that intergenerational trauma, um, you know, you want to make sure that, that you as an, an interviewer um, are able to handle that, I think, um, you know, if that's something that that 
you know, something within your own self that you're, you're working through um, that you carry with you. Um, you want to make sure that, that you're the right person for this interview and, and maybe you're not. Maybe it means, um, you know, working with someone outside your family to, to record that really important story. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, definitely the, the oral history boot camp um, and the trauma informed interviewing workshop, I'm sure we'll go much more in depth into this. Um, but, you know, caring for your own mental health through that process or asking questions in a way that, um, you know, you feel comfortable with, um, I think is, is really important. Christine, yeah, I think that's, a, that's great. And I think, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of experience with family interviewing. However, I did start doing my father's oral history and I felt like I was in a position to do this because I've come to a lot of understanding about him as a person and his journey, especially in terms of accepting me as a queer person, um, you know, as, and, I, and, and knowing that as a younger person, he was not always tolerant um, and he wasn't always tolerant of me like growing up. And, but at this point I'm like, well, he's grown and evolved. So I know that I can sit and listen to him talk about how he's evolved on these issues without getting um, hurt or offended. Cause I'm at a point now where I know that I'm okay. And I totally get like, everybody has a human evolution and we should allow people to change and grow, right? So, um, but if I wasn't at, in that mindset to do that, I think maybe how I would tackle that is to write up the questions that I want to know about, um, have somebody else do the interview. Maybe there's a lot of oral historians out there that have websites that are interested in doing family histories and they, you know, they may charge a fee. So you'd have to see, you know, what, you know, what you're willing to, um, budget for that. But, um, you know, and then think about, do I want to listen to this now or do I want to put it in the family vault for a little while and listen to it later? Um, and for my father, particularly, he is OK with sharing these stories with me, but he is not willing for my siblings to and, and broader family members to listen to it yet. He's just not ready. Um, but he was like, after I'm gone, you can share it with whoever. So it's kind of like also, you know, you have to communicate with the family member, too, because they may also be worrying the same thing, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, really coming at like a shared consent again, you know, um, and uh, figuring out the best strategy that will cause the least harm for both of you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, I think, a really important approach that, that you recommended and grateful for you sharing your personal experiences within your own family, sharing, you know, recording your own family stories as well. Um, so I think what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to switch over and listen to kind of a clip that really mm -hmm. illustrates some of these um, different interview techniques that we've been talking about for the past 20 or so minutes. Um, and Kristen, I'll, I'll hand it back on over to you to um, introduce this clip. Sure. So this this clip is um, an interview, an oral history interview that's on our website with Angela Rain who is a black transgender woman who is, um, she has written and published the first transgender magazine in Newark, which is so cool. And she's just a wonderful person. And so when you, when, I'd like to share this oral history because I think it's um, a great example of interview questions and how someone can really get into, into sharing a memory. And, um... The dollhouse was the first openly gay Newark, gay Newark, <laughs> Newark gay club. Um, that was a disco. And uh, we had uh, everyone from the LGBT community coming in from everywhere. I mean, we had people coming in from North Jersey, South Jersey, and it was predominantly African-American. And um, it was really nice. Yeah, can, can you describe it physically, what it would be like to walk in? When you walked up the stairs and you came through the door, you walked into the bar area. And to the right of the bar area was the dance floor, which was a nice size room. Um, it had maybe benches around the... Uh, no, it had like one bench on the side of the windows. Uh, the usual disco lights and all that good stuff. The DJ booth was, everything was floor level. There was, the DJ booth was not above everyone else. Everything was floor level. 
And um, to the left of the bar area was the lounge area where we had tables and extra seating and a small bar in there also. And one more room over was the, I would say the entertainment room where we put on shows, we had a stage and everything. Yeah. What kind of music then? So it was all disco? Disco. Or... <laughs> it, was a, it was a disco, yeah. Um, but uh, after, once we, once the club got going and we had amateur night, um, I auditioned for amateur night and me and a few other people uh, did amateur night. And um, then I became a fixture in the club. <laughs> and um, I went from performing to waiting tables and I became one of Bobby White Review's last member. Actually, I was the very last member. And um, what else, what else, what else? We, it was the funniest thing. We did a spin off of the Playboy Bunnies. Okay. And we called ourselves the Dollhouse Dolls. And we had to have either jet black sheer stockings or fishnets. And we wore high heels and a bun and uh basically a bunny outfit. We wore what was out then called dance skins. Okay. We had on a dance skin with a tail with the cuffs and the ears and the tie. It was funny, but it was Yeah, so I mean, I wish um, I would like you to in the chat, you know, um, as you're thinking about what you heard there, you know, what did you notice about the interviewers technique uh, about the stories being shared. Um, and I think too, like what as the interviewer, what would you want to follow up on what else would you want to know, or, you know, what did what did Angela mention that you think should should uh, warrant some clarification or just might provoke um, her to give you another story if you asked about it. So like in particular, what I, one thing I notice about this, this interview is, is which was done by our, by our other uh, co-director, Whitney Strube, was that he asked, you know, what music was played. It sounds like such an, in, like an, like a simple question, but when you think about it, like music is so evocative, you know, and it's such a, it sparks such a sense memory of that time. And you see like, Angie really like, got into that she was like yeah that's disco you know like the disco and that like caused her to kind of like enter even more into that memory um but yeah anything else you notice please um put it in the chat um and anything else you think could have been asked um add that as well Oh, actually, Abe asks, um, for an oral history of a close group, is it best to do that individually than as a group? Can the interplay of storytelling muddy it up or make it more dynamic? I think it depends. I mean, you can do um, group interviews, but you have to realize that you're going to get only you're gonna get less story from each person, bottom line. You know what I mean? Um, unless you sort of do that group interview um, with the intention going in that you're going to maybe jot down for yourself ways, like other questions you'd wanna follow up with each person individually. Um, but I have seen, um, there's this great book, uh, Bodies of Evidence about queer oral history. And there's uh, at least one example of a, of an interview that was an oral history interview with two people as the in, as the interviewees, and it's really interesting how it changes the how it changes the dynamic, and 
in this chapter, they have a whole essay on what they noticed about how that dynamic can be fruitful to have an extra person there. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. I noticed Christina um, added the name and all the information of that book. It's such a great book. Highly, highly, highly recommend. And you can also check out an interview that again, which Droob did with um, Raymond Proctor, who had sadly passed away, um, but his family agreed to do an interview with Wit on his life. And it's just, it's a super beautiful interview. So it's possible, you know what I mean? It's, it's great. You just have to like plan for it, know what may come up or how to kind of like um, navigate it for, for yourself. Um, yeah. Um, if anybody needs to take a break right now to use the bathroom or <laughs> get yourself a hot tea, <laughs> um, feel free. Um, we'll give you about five minutes and, um, but thank you first for being here so far. Great. So we'll, we'll come back together at, um, 2.35, uh, Eastern time. Um, and what we're going to run through in the last uh, you know, 25 minutes or so is we're going to have a breakout session um, where you get paired with, with someone else um, to kind of practice some of these interview skills. And then we're also going to run through, um, you know, what to do after you've connected interviews, kind of the, the applications. Um, so Kristen said, pl please feel free to take that bio break and we'll come back together in just a few minutes. We also want to draw your attention very quickly to some upcoming events that we're co-sponsoring. One on coming out day, October 11th, which is Sankofa and the promise. Oh, you're going to play the video. Excellent. <laughs> I'm just going to put in the chat or the link to our events page. So we hope that you'll uh, join us for future events and also join some of our sponsors. Thank you. Go. Came out of the club at my first girlfriend, actually at Club Zanzibar, and it was during that crazy time period. Um, and you know that was just when I was Pandora's box right there, and it was it was done. She was dancing to um, "Was That All It Was" by Jean Kim, Jean Carnes, and I'll never forget. Like she was up again, she was just dancing with herself in a mirror, and the room was like this smoky blue, and 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 it seemed like we were the only two people in the entire space. But I know there had to be more people there. But you know that's how I remember it. And then um, she turned around, and that was the end of that. And my childhood friend Joseph said to me, "I want you to come with me to this gay consciousness raising group." that is meeting in the basement of this bar on 4th Street or 5th Street in Newark. I was also uh, a student here at Rutgers in Newark. And, and there was a group that formed here, it was called RAGE, uh, Rutgers Association for Gay Equality or something like that. That's it, film aggressive butch. So I went from aggressive, then I went to Butch, but trans never in there. 
I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And I knew like butches who were taking hormones, like I knew about testosterone or whatever. But we never used the word transgender. It was, oh, she a butch. If you strapped on and you wore your strap 24 seven, you still was a butch. I don't recall transgender or the acronyms that they use like F to M. Now, it'll come up with book. And they made me go back to church and promptly, you know what I'm saying, at the church field trip to gay day, I mean, to, to the gospel fest at Six Flags, I dang sure found the other gay people. And it was right where kind of a city, um, not city hall, a uh, symphony hall was on Broad Street. And it was our party spot. You'd have a party and we'd hang out and we'd have the teen parties back in the day. But this was like really specifically to queer. And it was like a little village right here in North. Um, it was a safe haven. You could go and you would hang out and you'd see your people. And it was a place that you really could feel safe. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, so feel free to bring your tea on back to the space. Um, we'll, we'll come back in just the next minute or so um, to start with our interview exercise. Okay, so I think we're about ready to um, come back together. Again, this is the kind of practice session. Um, and I'm gonna have Kristen introduce um, this exercise that we have ahead of us. And I'll work on putting some breakout rooms for everyone together. Um, if there's anyone who uh, you know may have other things going on at the moment and would prefer not to participate in the breakout rooms, um, please feel free to just write in the chat I'll we'll make sure that you um, don't get included in that portion. Um, the exercise itself will just last about 10 minutes, so we'll all be going back together very shortly. Yeah, so we wanted to give you all the opportunity, especially if you haven't already done any interviewing, to have some sort of like experience where there's no, you know, it's very low stakes. And so you can um, just sort of like get a sense and a feel for what it's like to be um, interviewing someone for their oral history. So basically what you're going to do is when you head into the breakout room, um, right now while we're putting the breakout rooms together, just sort of think of a question that you would wanna ask somebody about the community they grew up in. Just sort of one uh, open-ended question that they could answer. Um, so you're going to be in these breakout rooms for 10 minutes. So for the first five minutes, uh, one person will be the interviewer and ask their question. The other person will be the respondent. And then after five minutes, you will switch. Um, and then the other person will ask their question. Um, and the, um, you know, and the other person will be the interviewee. Um, yeah, so definitely like as you're doing it, kind of, you know, think about how it feels. Um, what is working, what isn't, if possible. I know it's a short amount of time. Um, yeah, and just let us know like any observation you might have about the process um, when you come when we come back together in, in the large group. Um, cool, Erica. Do you need a? Are you okay with the breakout rooms? Do you need a minute? I think I might just need one more second. Um, one person named John um, is not able to join the breakouts. Okay, perfect. Just working on putting this together. Okay. Um, Alyssa, either she cannot join or they cannot join. No or she, problem. Sorry, the pronouns. Okay. Um, all right. We're almost there. Just give me one last moment. Just and of sure course, inter introduce you, you know yourselves to each other when you get in the, the breakout room. For sure, feel free to, to take a minute um, before you ask a question and then you know get to know each other just like you'd build rapport in a, a normal interview. 
Um, and then I would say also just for one of you to kind of keep an eye on your time so that you each get about five minutes. So I think um, we're going to have one room of three. Nope, actually, I think we're good. OK, I think we are good here. If there's anyone that I may have accidentally assigned who'd prefer not to be assigned, just just let us know. Um, I think you're going to be able to pop back into the main room, and just just you know, inform us if there's an issue. But um, it looks like we have five rooms of uh, 10 people total that will be participating in this exercise. Um, we'll open up the rooms. And then halfway at the, the five minute mark, um, I'll send a little message and say switch roles, you know, the person who is the interviewer, uh, switch over to being the interviewee. Um, and we'll come back together at 2.50 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So that's in, in 10 minutes. So I'm going to open up all the rooms now. Kristen. Um, I guess I wanted to make sure that your last message, I don't know if it was sent as a broadcast or not. Do you want to just maybe put it, or maybe only I can broadcast? Um, right, yeah. Um, if you want to phrase it, but I don't uh, feel free to. I wrote it very quickly. that sent before <laughs> I got to edit it, but hopefully it was all right. <laughs> I have a set three and a half minutes. Okay. So far. I'm just going to look at the chat and see if there is anything that I don't think we missed anything, but just any other topics we should kind of bring up mm -hmm. at the end. Absolutely. I've got to set two minutes for that five minute, for first five minutes. That's good.
Okay, we're at the one minute mark. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, broadcast, here we go. So strange that the co host can't help with the breakout rooms. I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, maybe I could have. I, I think if I had hit more. I don't, I'm afraid to touch anything right now. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Sorry, this is my first uh, kind of webinar hosting. Yeah. So I'm a little, I'm definitely rough. <laughs> it's, it's been interesting. I think there's a lot, even after a year and a half of the pandemic where everyone's on Zoom, like, I don't know, the Zoom features, they're still, I don't know, things to be want I guess it's kind of they're still wanting is what I meant to say like there there's still ways that they could make this process a lot easier I think <laughs> yeah it's not intuitive at all yeah I restarted my timer by the way thank you so much <laughs> mm -hmm. um okay so just kind of looking at the last little bit ahead um so we'll spend, I guess, just like a few minutes with um, report backs on key takeaways or things like that. Maybe just call in like one or two groups, I guess. Mm. And then I can switch over for just the last few minutes talking about, you know, what should and could be done after the interview process. Um, and I'll still try to leave a few more minutes for questions after that. Mm -hmm. Does that sound okay? <laughs> Perfectamundo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely for the boot camp, if you wouldn't mind, because you're really obviously very good at Zoom compared to me. Um, if yeah, it, maybe we can have a practice together in terms of uh, learning the tech technology better for. For sure. It seems like they're changing the features every every week though. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's do a run through that again. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, three minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> I know it's way too quick, but <laughs> I'm glad everyone's flexible and hopefully they'll have, you know, little key insights from that experience too. Yeah. I've switched over to seltzer now. Nice. <laughs> You've moved out of the tea phase. <laughs> <laughs> tea is so last hour. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Do you like my uh, Dorothy Marcus's? Uh, no, no, I will not have a nice day. <laughs> I love it so much. I saw uh, Dominique's comment about it popped up just as I was presenting. I couldn't say anything in the moment, but uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> Uh, about two minutes left. Okay. How many groups total did you say there was? Five. Okay, so we'll hear from like one or two, you said? Yeah, I think so. Maybe just take five minutes and then I'll try to keep all the rest of the stuff kind of brief. <laughs> okay, two minutes now. <laughs> Oh yeah, and then I'll plug the social media, the mailing list. I should put that in the chat. Got a minute left here. Okay. Reminder. I have slides about the mail. This must be like burning. I don't know what it feels like, but I saw the mailer last night too. And I was like, how's 
Maybe the hole? No, because that's going to that here. I thought it was showing. All right, I think I should start the timer now because I think it's a 60 second closure. So I'm gonna close all the rooms and I think everyone will trickle back in. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Breakout rooms in progress appeared on my screen. I'm not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I've seen your front and center of my screen. <laughs> it was oh, like, let me stop my video. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was, it was beautiful. I, lo I love your frame. You were right <laughs> there in the center. <laughs> I, I love the case of our pride. Yeah. <laughs> Progress flag, flag frame. Yes. Yes. Just found out we could do that today without stopping my, you know, because sometimes when you put a filter or a background, it slows down your entire Wi-Fi. <laughs> But it didn't. Oh, that's great. Good to know. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I know that ten minutes was way too short to get to know each other and to you know share all about your um, communities. But I hope that it was just a, a little taste of the what oral history can offer. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of open the space in our remaining few minutes um, for any reflections um, that you have. From that interview process, either on the side of being an interviewer, on the side of being an interviewee, or as we call them, narrators. Um, if there's anyone who might like to, to share um, from their group what they experienced, um, we have just a, a few minutes uh, where we can do that before progressing to the final part of the presentation. Yeah, maybe even in, in regarding like the ways in which you asked the question, like, was it fruitful, or do do you wish you had, could have rephrased it or something? I'll comment. <laughs> All right, well, um, I was fortunate to be paired with a, a wonderfully um, inviting person who did frame the question really well. Um, and for me, <laughs> I always think of, of ways that to draw out, particularly if you have someone that doesn't want to talk as much. <laughs> so I asked the question in a couple of, of different ways and they kindly did the same thing for me. So if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have started with the second way I phrased the question. <laughs> um, so it, I, I would always say to anyone that's here, if ever you feel that the person you're interviewing didn't quite understand what you were trying to ask or get at, never worry about rephrasing and reframing and just say, well, if I can ask this another way. Yeah, that's such a great observation. And I see that Alexandra put in the chat, coming up with questions was a little bit challenging, trying to find the right wording and framing is something I would love to work more on. I think that's where like having some sort of uh, interview guide sheet written up beforehand is always like a, such a great help. Um, and then being very, um, and being familiar with the ways in which you can ask questions that are more open-ended so that if you want to ask something that's a follow-up off the sheet that you have um, that's not there already, you know how to kind of phrase it. And I think, um, you know, again, not to be all pluggy, but, you know, if you come to the oral history boot, boot camp, um, we're going to have more chances and opportunities for folks to practice. Um, Isabella, wrote in the chat that they ended up asking a very open question uh, and let them interpret it. And then I ran with how they interpreted it to get more information on how they viewed their community networks. Awesome, that's really cool. I'm glad that 
you were able to kind of like take this and follow up. Yeah, excellent, excellent feedback. I loved it, Abe's approach as well with, um, you know, starting with the lighter questions versus meaty ones and, um, you know, how that can really affect the, the interview space. So it's, it's great to hear that even with such a short exercise, you're able to explore some of these different kind of approaches. Great. Um, so I think I see Jennifer has raised her hand. Would you like to, to um, unmute? Um, Jennifer, did you have a question to share? Um, just while you're maybe putting some information in the chat. Oh, I see you can't unmute. All right, here we go. Just ask. Okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just share um, really quickly. Dominique was wonderful to talk to. And one thing that kind of popped up for me, um, it, and I mentioned this to Dominique, is when asked about a question around my community that I grew up in, I feel like community has a word that's really useful to academics, but when, because I grew up in a neighborhood that didn't have a, a cohesive sense of community, that word trips me up because I'm like, I don't, I don't know what my community was like when I was younger. Um, whereas neighborhood seems to feel like a more inviting way for me to talk about the dynamics of the people that I grew up around. So, um, so that was just a good reminder for me of just even like the the words that we use might mean something to us, but as you were saying, you might have to come at it a couple different ways when you're talking to somebody. For sure. I think that definitely goes back to, I see Tiffany put in the chat here, um, try to flow with the conversation, um, the questions asked. Um, so I, yeah, I think just keeping flexible and um, reframing like, like others have said is, is really important. Yeah, um, and we're not, we're not all monoliths. Like everybody has a different, like you said, way of growing up and different life experience. And it is interesting to think about how language doesn't apply the same to everyone. That's such a great, that's such a great um, feed, like observation. For sure. And Tiffany, I see that your hand is up. Um, I'll ask to unmute you. You're welcome to, um, to share some further reflections as well. Um, this is one thing. So I've listened to a lot of the interviews on the website and stuff um and just um Isabella was my partner and they did a really good job at asking questions and for me when I was asking them questions um I consistently wanted to whenever they said something I wanted to be like oh you know like my reaction to it almost like oh you know I'm I'm sorry or oh wow that's great or oh wow that sucks you know so I have like a deep appreciation now for interviewers because in those interviews, you never do that. You just let them talk and then you ask another question. And that's such a strong thing I'm realizing because it's, I guess, so easy for me to just immediately try to empathize with the person or react or, you know what I mean? And I guess in these interviews, you're supposed to, you know, let them go. <laughs> so I have a, a deep appreciation for it now. Yeah. And I think all that to say too, like, all of that is so true. And like Christina added in the chat, facial expressions and nods get us through. But I think you can also like always validate the person, like be like, that was a really powerful story. Like, thank you for sharing that, you know? And if it's something where you're like, oh my God, I had the same exact experience. Like they told a story about, I don't know, playing on a soccer team. And you're like, I was on a soccer team and I played the same position. And you want to be like, talk about that. Sometimes I just jot that down in my notes. Like when the interview is over, I'm going to be like, oh, same. I totally played soccer and I totally got hit in the face with the ball too. You know what I mean? Or something like that. So I think you can still sort of have that moment where you connect together. It just may not be within the interview confines. Um, and what Isabella wrote in the chat, um, that they appreciated that empathy in the moment because it made them feel comfortable. So I think that's that's a great, uh, you know, kind of framework that you don't necessarily have to leave all of yourself at the door. Um, you can also, uh, yeah, just be human, uh, express emotion and, and empathy, whether it's you know, non-verbally kind of in your facial expressions, whether it's like a comment afterwards, um, all of that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's, it's really important for the interview process. Um, I just make one note 
Don't be afraid at the start of the conversation to tell them that you're not, you're going to try to limit your audio responses so that you're not going to say this in the moment because it can feel really awkward sharing very personal experiences and the person seeing them not respond. So definitely let them know because that way it's on record and it's all about them having the experience. And also if, if there is something very sensitive, please also ask if they need a moment and if they want the recording paused because sometimes that also helps to build connection. Yeah, I always make sure there's tissues in the room just, just in case, uh, water, um, things like that. But yeah, I always be like, do you need a moment? We can pause. Like. <laughs> you're more important than, you know, us keeping the recorder on. Like, do you need water? Do you need a tissue? Do you want to use the restroom? That sort of thing. For sure. Um, and I know that we're just about at the, the 3 p.m. mark. Um, so maybe just kind of wrapping up some of these conversations and transitioning, you know, after you've had this moment of, of really getting to know someone so intimately in, in this oral history space, um, you know, what do you do afterwards um, to continue that conversation um, to ensure that they remain involved with the project. So I'm just going to take um, a couple minutes to, to run through that. Um, for those that have to leave, absolutely no problem. We're, we're just about at the end and you know we'll be uh, sharing the recording of this workshop. So if there's any kind of final tips that you might be missing, you're welcome to tune back into that recording and um, you know hear my final reflections. But I'm just going to go back to um, sharing my screen for one last moment. So just some, some final kind of quick reminders about what you do after this, this interview session. You know, you always want to be thanking your, your interviewee throughout the entire process um, for, for sharing their stories, for contributing to your project. Um, just like Kristen was saying about, you know, jotting down some notes um, during the interview and making sure they feel comfortable with that. You also want to take a moment after the, the oral history session and really think about, you know, what story stood out to you, any reflections you have for the process any unasked questions um, that you may like to go back and, and have a follow-up interview around. Um, some other quick reminders, you know, back up and log your files. Um, so that means, you know, as soon as you get home, if you're you know, out and about somewhere, um, download a copy of that interview file onto your computer, put it in the cloud, whatever storage system you have in place, um, and keep track of, you know, the fact that you're you know, adding a new interview to the collection. Um, like I mentioned, fo schedule a follow-up session, um, send a copy of the recording back to the, the narrator. That's, that's very important in oral history as well. And as your project continues to develop, you know, keep the participants informed and uh, at the core of, of that project, especially if you're planning to host any kind of community events or um, you know, launching oral history online. So I'll just mention here, um, you know, as you're thinking about uh, different kind of applications of, of your interview, um, you really want to make sure you have this, this key information written down, like you can see on our website. Um, so I talked about the inter interview introduction, you know, the people that participated in the interview, the dates, the location, all that is really essential in kind of keeping track of all the recordings. Um, and then you also want to make sure, like in this example, that you have a biography and an interview summary written uh, for the interviewee so that you're able to really um, you know, I guess, honor their, their story um, and present it back in a way that's accurate. So they need to be part of that process as well. And finally, I'll just, um, with some quick reminders of how oral histories can be used. Um, so here, you know, it can be definitely part of uh, community events. Um, you can create exhibitions, you can do walking tours. Um, there's a, a digital walking tour. Uh, that, that Queer Newark has as well as an in-person one, um, you know, for kind of important LGBTQ uh, milestones and, and sites across the city. Um, so we definitely encourage you to kind of keep uh, track of our programming for that's going to be in person, as well as looking at some of our digital resources that we have. Um, you can think about, you know, creating uh, art installations or theater and dance pieces based on oral history. Um, and there's just so many different applications and, and we're here to help brainstorm with you. So please don't feel free, please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions at all. And wrapping up, just another quick reminder that we um, are looking for community participants, uh, whether you want to be an interviewer or share your own story, um, Queer Newark uh, widely encourages uh, volunteers to become part of our project. 
So we encourage you to, to be in touch with us. Um, feel free to, to follow up. We're going to be sending a, a survey around after this workshop. And just let us know if you want to contribute to Queer Newark um, in some way. So I will just wrap up here um, by handing it back over to, to Kristen to kind of run through um, some of our events that we have coming up, some of the ways to, to get in touch with us. But just wanted to thank everyone that, that came out today. Um, thank you for your, your presence. Thank you for your amazing questions, um, for being interested in uh, engaging this, this different form of historical documentation and storytelling, which is so important in doc democratizing history. Um, I also want to, to thank you for the, the time you took to practice with each other and encourage you to continue to do that. As you set out on your own interview projects, um, it's really important to kind of be interviewed for your, by, like, about your own story first, I think, um, because once you're able to share your own story, then you can really understand the, the vulnerable uh, and connective space that the oral history offers. So we recommend keep, keep on practicing. Um, and again, we're here as resources, as you continue to think through your projects, um, we're very glad to discuss them with you. So yeah. I'll send on back over to Kristen. Yeah, just, you know, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Queer Newark. Um, we have a YouTube. You can watch our previous events if you'd like. You could join our mailing list, queernk at newark.rockers.edu. Um, please reach out by email if you want to be on that list or if you want to volunteer with us or if you are yourself someone who has a story to tell with Queer Newark, please let us know. Um, the oral history boot camp that I had mentioned is going to be in November. The date will be uh, to be announced. Um, we will announce that soon. Um, so just keep a lookout on our on our uh, website and our social media. That that boot camp will likely take place over two days. That we'll have sessions, including again an overview of oral history, but also trauma informed uh, interviewing, uh, as well as archiving and preservation and privacy and how to put these uh, oral histories into action. You know, like how do what do you once you have a collection, what do you what can you do with this? Uh, maybe make an exhibit, or maybe you want to branch out into podcasting or um, walking tours, things of that nature. So um, I hope you'll all come back and join us for that as well. And um, just again, as, as Erica said, thank you so, so much. Um, we appreciate all of you and good luck to you all uh, with your projects. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you all again. Um, and if there's anyone who has a really pressing question they wanna ask us, you're welcome to We'll stick around for another couple minutes. Um, and otherwise, have a great day. And we hope to, to see you at our programming again soon. Great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording now.